mentioning the Connolly Association uh, reminds me that uh, during the year we lost a valuable friend of the school, Charlie Cunningham, who uh, was, was a regular <coughs> attender at the school uh, and had a, a history of trade union and political activist, activism going back um, for, for a considerable period of, of, of time. It just falls for me to introduce the person who is going to chair tonight's session, uh, Mick uh, O'Reilly. And I was thinking uh, maybe that you could say of Mick that his involvement in political and trade union activism probably almost goes back as far as the period that's under discussion <laughs> tonight. But I made the silly mistake of telling Mick that, that I was going to say that. And he tells me, in fact, that Mick O'Reardon used to do this, the same line. So uh, it, was, it was somewhat uh, taken away. So just one final thing, there's a, an attendance sheet that's going to be, be circulated. Only fill it in once, but it's an important document for us. I, um, what I mean is, don't if you come to a session tomorrow, don't, don't, don't uh, fill, it, fill it in. Uh, it's important for us um, for to send out notifications for schools and so on. So without further ado, hand over to Mick. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try and be fairly brief. Uh, Woody Allen, the uh, film director, said he'd done a course in speed reading and uh, he read War and Peace and somebody said to him, what's it about? And he said, Russia. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, British communist historian Eric Hobsbawm said that the 20th century started in 1917 and ended in 1989 and it was about yeah. Soviet Russia. Tonight's uh, 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 lecture is going to deal with the impact of that on Ireland. But I just want to mention Michael O'Reardon because Michael O'Reardon would be a hundred if he had lived. And I got very annoyed during the week when I heard all this ballyhoo on uh, RTE about Jack Lynch. Not that Jack Lynch isn't entitled to his place in history. He is. <coughs> but I think that there's a more interesting Corkmen who are a hundred uh, this year than Jack Lynch and I think Michael O'Reardon is one of them and I rang up Archie over it and uh, had a row with them and then I rang up people in the doll and said they should be doing something about this so I'm, 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 I'm hoping that they're going to do something in Cork uh, uh, about this because Michael O'Reardon used to say to me that he was intimately connected with the Russian Revolution he said, the guns of the Aurora, when the uh, Navy changed sides and supported the Bolsheviks and shot the guns from the Aurora into the, uh, the, the Winter Palace, uh, he said, the impact of that brought him into the world prematurely and he was connected with the Russian Revolution uh, ever since. <laughs> well, he was certainly connected with the with the, Ru the Russian Revolution. Whether that happened or not, I don't know. But he, it, it's a, it's a great story. So uh, he, he had a font of of great stories. Uh, tonight we have two speakers. We have Michael Quinn, who has compiled a history of uh, Ireland's relationship with the USSR over the whole period. But tonight he's going to. Uh, look at the question of uh, that relationship between the early part of, of, the, uh, of the Bolshevik uh, Revolution from 1917 to 1922. It is interesting that the only country in the world that recognised the first uh, Irish Republic was the USSR when it was fighting for its uh, life. Uh, 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 this came about by an exchange of papers uh, in America. Uh, of course, that republic was crushed uh, in a counter-revolution uh, in Ireland and therefore those ideas never formally developed 
until much later, and there was great difficulties here uh, in relation to people who were pro-Soviet. Uh, uh, uh. it, it is true to say that in the Irish labour movement, the Russian Revolution was welcomed. Uh, uh, Irish Republicans welcomed uh, the, the Russian Revolution, and it had a huge uh, impact. Indeed, Lenin argued that uh, had 19, 1916 was premature, and had it taken place after the Russian Revolution, a very different outcome would have taken place. Now, I'm not sure whether you can prove any of those things uh, or not. It is true that the legacy of the Russian Revolution was a very spontaneous event. It was a very creative event. But its consolidation created many achievements, but also many mistakes were made. And some of those mistakes uh, led to, to many of the Bolsheviks themselves uh, being, being uh, uh, killed, uh, judicial murder, all kinds of things happened. The left suffered as well as gained from the legacy of the Soviet Union. It's a very complex story. So to help try and unravel and look at this and its impact uh, uh, on Ireland, I'm going to call on Michael Quinn first to, sorry, <laughs> they reversed it on me. <laughs> I'm going to call on Emmett O'Connor. Uh, and I just want to make one point uh, about Emmett. He's completed a second uh, book on Jim Larkin, uh, and I've just finished uh, reading it. And I have to say, it's a, it's a marvellous book. And the thing about it is, it's scholarly, it's critical, but I will say this much about him. He likes Jim Larkin. A lot of people who, ri who write about Jim Larkin don't like him, and uh, he likes him. And, and that, to me, that, that to me, uh, uh, makes it a very good book. This was uh, kind, kind words, Mick. Uh, been asked to speak on uh, connections between Ireland and the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, I know of only two. Maxim Litvinov, uh, he, he taught uh, in Belfast, uh, he taught in the Jaffe Public Elementary School, taught languages for a few years. And uh, Lenin, as we, as we now all know, uh, spoke uh, English with a rap line accent. At least we have Roddy Connolly's word uh, to, uh, to, to take for, for that. So having said that, I'll now hand you over to Mick. Just joking. <laughs> right. Um, first of all, a bit of context. Um, you got to remember that the, the labour movement, almost up to the revolution, was really just uh, a collection of trade unions. It had been formed in 1894 uh, with the formation of the Irish uh, Trade Union Congress. And Congress only represented about 5% of waged labour in the 1890s. But that was important because it meant the birth of the, you know, the idea of labour as a movement, the idea that labour wasn't just about um, representing workers on, on the shop floor, but uh, it had its own agenda. And, uh, and to that end, uh, it had a parliamentary committee, so-called, because the, the idea was that the unions would come together annually and uh, their, um, they would pass resolutions, and then these would be... Uh, put before uh, MPs. The, the Parliamentary Committee's job was to lobby M MPs. So this was in effect the executive. This, this is the Parliamentary Committee in 1897. You can see they all look pretty respectable in their uh, waistcoats and their watch chains. The president here, P.J. Leo, a pork butcher, has a cane and a cigar. So, uh, you know, they don't look like a very radical or revolutionary uh, bunch of people. So um, the, the, the question then facing, the big question I think facing the Trade Union Congress was how it could uh, give effect uh, to the labour agenda. And there were, there were really four options. I mean, one was uh, no party politics. Now, that was associated, I think, with uh, this man here in the centre. He, at least he was typical of that, kind of, that, that stream of thought. Uh, James McCarran, the tailor from Derry, he usually topped the elections to, to the parliamentary committee. Um, the, the, the second option, I kind of mix up the slides here, but this, the second option was to support the parliamentary party, the, let's say the Home Rule Party, become a kind of lobby within the Home Rule Party and develop a kind of labour nationalist force. And that was associated particularly with uh, Michael Davitt. He was a strong advocate of um, the, the, the Home Rule Party linking up with the British labour movement and the Irish Labour Movement forming some kind of caucus within the, the Home Rule Party. Third option was associated in particular with uh, William Walker, the, the centenary of his death uh, next year. 
and uh, you know whatever the, the problem for Walker joining the British Labour Party was the answer and he argued that um, Irish Labour should sort of sink its differences because it was of course divided to some degree between the Unionist North, the Nationalist South they should sink their differences within the, the British uh, Labour Party and uh, he famously stood in Belfast for the North Belfast seat on three occasions. He finally got a run in, in Britain, and this is a leaflet that he had when he was um, standing for the Leith Boroughs constituency in 1910, just outside uh, Edinburgh. So the, um, the strategy that finally w won out was um, that advocated by Jim Larkin, although it was Connolly who proposed that Congress should form uh, a Labour Party. It, it, was, uh, it was really Larkin who, who laid the ground, and I think the growth of uh, Larkinism as a force within the Labour movement and um, the apparent imminence of Home Rule, the, the fact that it seemed it was going to be a Home Rule Parliament in Dublin, in 1914, or by 1914. I think that sort of tipped, tipped the scales. So, so in, um, in 1912, uh, Congress passes this motion that it should uh, contest uh, elections. Then in 1914, uh, it, it changed its name to the Irish Trade Union Congress and Labour Party. But it doesn't create any separate political machinery and that was partly the syndical influence and this feeling already by 1911, 1912, there was this feeling in Britain that the, um, the Labour Party was, was creating a parliamentary, you know, a, a kind of career-oriented political elite who were betraying <coughs> the mass of workers. So they wanted to avoid that mistake in Ireland and for that reason the idea was it wouldn't create separate political machinery so the party would be completely controlled by the trade unions. And uh, it was expected, of course, that the trade unions would all vote Labour. So uh, this was the position then in, in, in 1914. The outbreak of the, the war following the, the, um, the big lockout in, in Dublin, you know, dealt a blow to Labour because British Labour and Irish Labour still, in only was kind of dependent on British Labour at this time, it declares an industrial truce with, with the outbreak of the war. And um, th there was a suspension of strikes for the duration. Some strikes do, do take place, but by and large, the unions, um, you know, tuck in be behind the government and uh, the war effort. But it's clear by late 1915 that the war is beginning to strengthen and radicalise certain sections of labour, particularly those that are close, closest or most necessary to the war effort, uh, dockers and, and, and seamen. Generally, it's a very bad time for workers because inflation sets in with the outbreak of war, prices start to go up, you've got shortages, and workers are on fixed incomes. There's no kind of rationing uh, system in place. <laughs> so people on fixed incomes are doing badly, and uh, there's a feeling that um, employers, shopkeepers, farmers, they're, you know, they're doing well out of the war, and in some cases profiteering, and this stores up a lot of uh, class tensions, which really kind of come to the fore in the second half of the war. So, um, in 1916, you've got the threat of a munitions strike in Britain, and of course, this would be quite disastrous for the war effort. So the British government agrees to, uh, to liquidate national assets to release more money into the economy. So from uh, early 1917 up to 1920, because you give it a brief boom just after the war, um, the, the wages start to rise faster than prices. But of course the money is only there for those who can get it, and to get it you need to join the trade union. So there's a huge expansion of uh, trade union membership, particularly in the Irish case, the ITGWU has 5,000 members in 1916, it has 120,000 in, uh, in, in 1920. So um, why then this should, should Labour uh, support um, the Bolsheviks? Well, first of all, you, you have this background of growth and, and radicalisation. And then there are international efforts to revive the Socialist International. The first international formed in 1864 by Karl Marx, among others. It's really just a bureau in London and another in New York. But in 1889, the Socialist parties um, come together internationally and they formed the Second International. 
and this becomes um, not exactly an annual conference, but a sort of a, a biennial, sometimes triennial uh, conference. And in the 1900s, they talk increasingly about the possibility of another big European war, and they say, we won't allow it. If the governments vote to go to war, we call a general strike. We won't let the European working class march off to kill each other. <coughs> so what happens in 1914? Solidarity collapses. The Socialist parties, mostly, not always, but, but mostly, they tuck in behind their governments. And the, um, the support of the German Social Democratic Party, which is the great example of socialist parties worldwide, when they voted war credits, to the German government, that was a real shock to, to, to the left uh, internationally. But by 1916, 1917, certainly, you have increasing efforts to try and revive the, the international and maybe use it as a means of brokering some kind of a peace, because the war just seems to be dragging on and on, and there just seems to be no end in sight. Now, Connolly, of course, um, you know, after 1916, he's Labour's national martyr. He has, suddenly has this great status, which he didn't really have when he was alive. But um, people are very fond now of invoking, you know, the, the memory of, of Connolly, certainly by 1917. And uh, the Labour Party is very uh, conscious of the fact that, that Connolly had used the International Socialist Congress in Paris in 1900 as a means of asserting Labour's position on the international stage and asserting the Irish nationalist position on the international stage because Connolly had ensured that the Irish Socialist Republican Party delegates were recognised as a separate national delegation. They weren't part of, you know, seen as part of the British left. So they feel that this is a way in which they can make a contribution to, 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 to the national struggle and at the same time, you know, assert the place of Labour uh, internationally as well. And then you have... Um, the Bolshevik support for uh, self-determination and their opposition to the war. I mean, these are two things that really chime with public opinion in Ireland, particularly, uh, you know, from, from 1917 when opinion is starting to move towards Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin's against the war, and um, of course it's for national self-determination. And now it's easier to assert Labour's position on the international stage than in domestic politics, because with the rise of Sinn Féin, domestic politics is getting a bit crowded and you really have three forces competing. You've got Sinn Féin, you've got the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Home Rule Party, and you've got the Ulster Unionists. And they all expect that Labour is going to be a lot stronger after the war. So they're all preparing special Labour programmes and making us, you know, a bid for, for the, uh, the Labour vote. So the Unionists formed the Ulster Unionist Labour Association. Um, the, uh, the Nationalist Party spokesman uh, on Labour, jo jo Joe Devlin, he proposes what he calls a new democratic movement and he proposes uh, profit sharing and uh, uh, systems of workers' control within factories and so on. And it was really Devlin who kind of came up with the slogan, Labour must wait, because they try to use that against Sinn Féin. They say, look, Sinn Féin is, is going to abstain from Westminster after the next election and they're saying to Labour, you have to wait 20, 30, 40 years until we get this eerie fairy republic and before we can introduce any social reforms. But we're going into Westminster and we're going to fight for social reforms, um, you know, for, for, for Labour. So that, that was really where the, where the slogan came from. <coughs> so these are the two kind of key people in the, the Labour movement there. On the left you have Tom Johnson, who's become a kind of a, an icon, I think, of the Parliamentary Labour Party. And um, Johnson was uh, he's from an English uh, background. He's the kind of guy who would fit comfortably into the back benches of the British Labour Party. Uh, he's a fairly, fairly moderate figure, but he, he was a very good secretary. He was very good at drawing up policy documents and position papers. Very keen to get Labour its place in the sun internationally in representation on the international stage. Unfortunately, he really wasn't a very good leader. And he, he had this personal aversion to any kind of conflict, and he was kind of shoved into the position of leader um, when the Labour Party entered the 1922. And um, he had a nervous breakdown in consequence. In 1925, he called an emergency meeting of the parliamentary, of the party executive, and he said, Look, I can't handle this. You know, you want a leader, get somebody else. And it says a lot about the state of the party that they said, Ah, oh, no, no, you're grand. Go away, take a break, and come back when you think you can. You know? There was no uh, Alan Kelly waiting in the wings. <laughs> so, um, 
Johnson was really the wrong man to be to be leader, but he he, he was he was quite a good secretary. I know William O'Brien um, from 1917. Uh, you know he was a tailor. He wasn't a member of the Transport Union, but he 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 joined the union and he intended to become the chief man in the union. And he made a lot of his connection with Connolly because he had been in the Socialist Republican Party with Connolly back in the uh, the 1890s. I think he was he was left wing. Um, he, he was certainly interested in labour politics, but first and foremost came the union, and his talent really was manager, managing the union. And people would later testify that he kind of governed the union through a, a reign of terror. He was sort of feared rather than liked. And um, in some ways, it's a pity that he kind of devoted himself so much you know, to, to the union, to the neglect of um, uh, political affairs. But one of the things that O'Brien did was to revive the Socialist Party of Ireland. This was the best connected Marxist party in, in Irish history, I think, and yet it's almost completely forgotten. The first Socialist Party had been formed in 1904 after Connolly went to America. This Irish Socialist Republican Party collapsed. And comrades back in Dublin formed the SPI. And then, kind of in anticipation, I think, of Connolly's return in 1910, uh, they revived the, the SPI and uh, it became very much associated with Connolly until um, the Labour Party agreed to form a political party and Connolly kind of lost interest in it then and, and the SPI kind of lapsed. But in January 1917, O'Brien revived the SPI and I think it was part of his plan to associate himself with Connolly and wrap himself in the, in the mantle of, of Connolly. And the party uh, quickly attracted you know, the, the leading people in the ITGW and the Irish Trade, Trade Union Congress and these, these were very sharp organisers. They were, you know, they were expanding, they were at a very ra radical time, so things were looking very promising for, for the party for a year or two anyway. Now, one of the kind of leading uh, party members was uh, Carl O'Shannon, who later <coughs> became a judge in the, um, the Labour Court. But um, O'Shannon, um, O'Shannon um, he, he co liked to call himself an Irish Bolshevik, and he was full of praise for what was going on in Russia. I'm not sure he fully understood what was happening in Russia, because he, he kind of, um, you know, somewhat he wrote about it was a bit, it was a bit vague and maybe a bit kind of misinformed. But anyway, he, he certainly very much identified with, uh, with the Bolsheviks. Very happy to call himself an Irish Bolshevik, and he's editor of the Voice of Labour, which is you know suppressed by the British. So then they replace it with the watchword of Labour, not suppressed by the British. So then they replace it with the voice of Labour again. And he's editor from 1918 to 1927. He gives a lot of coverage to radical affairs. And th this is um, an article uh, from Johnson uh, in the voice of Labour, uh, February 1918. He wrote this article, If the Bolsheviks Came to Ireland. And he has this quote, you know, we claim the Russian Revolution, etc. And this is, it gives you the temper of the times, because, I mean, Johnson is really a very moderate, social democratic kind of figure. As I say, he would have fitted into the, the, the British Labour Party quite happily, even under Tony Blair. And, um, and yet here he is, you know, full of um, this sort of blood and thunder stuff. And, he, and he's, he's, you notice he's saying, dethroning imperialism and capitalism, they, you know, they link the two. They link the national question and, and social question. And here's uh, a leaflet from um, the Russian Revolution and Republic Committee, Dublin Trades Council. And O'Shannon was a big Gael goer, so he liked to use the Irish title of the SPI as much as possible. Coming up to Heron was its, its Irish title. So um, he has these Irish subtitles. Interesting the way they translate Soviet Republic, Poblock and Loch Debra, mm. Labour Republic. Mm. So that was the view, you know, at the time in Ireland. Yeah. Labour, our crowd, us, we're in charge now in Russia. That was how a lot of people saw it. What year was that? This was uh, uh, 1918. It's, it's, it's to commemorate uh, the, the first anniversary. And you got this quotation then from Trotsky. Uh, just read it out in case you can read it. Are France, Italy, Great Britain and the United States willing to recognise the right to self-determination of their, uh, of their own destinies um, in the case of the peoples of Ireland, had, you know, in, in bold, Egypt, India, Madagascar, Indochina and other countries. To refuse this right to these peoples would mean the putting forward of the program of the most cynical imperialism. 
That's a quotation from Trotsky, 29th of December 1917. So again, they, they link up the national question and the, the social question. So you have it, the evolution of um, Labour's foreign policy in 1917-1918. In February, Dublin Trade Council calls for Irish self-determination and separate Irish representation at all international Labour conferences. So they're very much aware of the fact that there are moves to put back the international and Labour should be there and should be there as a separate national uh, de de delegation. And also following the February Revolution, because of course you had two revolutions in, I presume you're all familiar with this, but the, the Bourgeois Revolution in February or March by the, the we're talking about calendars earlier on, this is uh, another example of diff different calendars. Um, so there was a revolution um, in February by the by the old by the the Russian calendar. So, um, but what's interesting is that the uh, Irish Trade Union Congress sent its congratulations to the Petrograd Soviet, not to Kerensky or the Lvov government. They were identifying with the Bolsheviks because the other crowd wanted to keep the war going, whereas the Bolsheviks are against the war. So they're the people that you identify with. And this is uh, brought to a head very much uh, in August of 1918, the Irish uh, Trade Union, or sorry, August 1917, the Irish Trade Union Annual Congress meets in Derry, and um, there's this, this, this discussion of um, this Congress executive proposal to send two delegates to a, a Stockholm peace conference called by the Petrograd Soviet and the Dutch Stand Scandinavian Socialist Committee, mandated to, to establish the Irish Labour Party as a distinct unit in the international labour movement and to support the Russian Conference of Workers and Soldiers Delegates, war policy, peace without annexation or indemnities on the basis of national self-determination. And the debate is, it, it really breaks down on attitudes to the war. Now people who are pro-war, unionists, parliamentary party supporters, they're completely against sending the, the delegates whereas those who are um, anti-war would be more Republican or in favour of sending the, the delegates. Uh, and and the, uh, the latter, the sort of anti-war people, win by a, a two-to-one <coughs> majority. So that's the ITC conference in August 1917. So then in January then, um, a joint uh, Congress SPI delegation meets Litvinov. He's the Soviet planet, plenipotentiary in London. In February, the SBI call a meeting in the Mansion House to welcome the Bolshevik Revolution. They think a few hundred will turn up, over 10,000 turn up. In, uh, in August then, uh, the Congress meets uh, in Waterford and calls for the re-establishment of the Second International and it establishes uh, a Congress SBI committee as the Irish section of the International. So they're ver very keen that Ireland is going to be there in the next meeting of the International. <coughs> So the great sort of moment in the sun really is the Berne Conference. And it was really due to this that Dáil Éireann adopts a democratic programme. People think of the democratic programme as kind of thank you to Labour for standing down from the 1918 general election. It had nothing to do with the 1918 general election. But in January of 1919, Sinn Féin goes to Labour and said, look, you people are going to Berne. Could you put in a good word for us? Because in January of 1919, the various delegations are meeting in Paris for the Paris Peace Conference to produce the big post-war peace treaty, which will become the Treaty of Versailles. Everybody expects there's going to be a big payback for labour in the treaty, because the, partly because the trade unions have made you know, significant concessions to governments during the war to, to keep the war effort going, to accept the dilution, um, the employment of, of women workers to replace male craftsmen, various things like that but also to keep workers out of communism, you know, which, which is seen to be a real threat um, at this time. And of course, throughout Europe, you know, 1919, 1920, you're, you know, they're remembered as the, the two red years. So, um, the, uh, Sinn Féin expects that the left will, will have a big input into the post-war peace treaty, and they want um, Irish Labour to, to kind of support <coughs> recognition for the Republic. Uh, at, at Bern, and in, in return then they adopt, uh, I mean, L Labour says, well, we, we'd like to do that, but our voice mightn't carry much weight because we don't have any MPs. They're kind, of, they're kind of regret now, you see, that they didn't put forward MPs or didn't do a deal with Sinn Féin mm -hmm. in the election, because, I mean, that's, that's really why they, 
they chickened out of the stand for the election because Sinn Féin wanted a deal, but Labour was afraid that the, the, the vote would split between Sinn Féin and the Parliamentary Party, and they, they were expecting a wartime election. And a wartime election wasn't a, a problem because everybody on the nationalist side was abstaining from Westminster while the war was on. But now that the war was over, the war ended very suddenly, um, the Parliamentary Party was going to go back into Westminster, Sinn Féin was going to stay out. If Labour got four or five MPs elected, which way did they go? They didn't want to take sides on the thing. So they stand back, typical Tom Johnson, stand back, wait and see, do nothing. So uh, it turns out there's a big Sinn Féin landslide and Labour now realises we, we could have done a deal with Sinn Féin and that would have been safe enough. We missed the bus. Anyway, we're going off to Bern. We know MPs might not have much influence, but if you adopt our social manifesto as your programme, well, that'll give us some weight. It'll help us to help you. So that's really why the democratic work comes about. But significantly, the main issue with Bern, the Irish side with the left minority, and they actually vote against the motion for parliamentary democracy as, quote, it tended to condemn the Soviet system of government. And they say they had their long way a resolution demanding a dictatorship of the proletariat. Who were the Irish delegates? The delegates were uh, uh, Johnson and uh, Carlo Shannon. Okay. Yeah. So, um, coincidentally, and maybe it's not a coincidence, but the the guy who had uh, the sort of final say on the Sinn Féin side in drafting the Democratic Programme was Sean T. O'Kelly, and he's also the Sinn Féin delegate to the <coughs> Paris Peace Talks. Because Sinn Féin didn't expect to win independence through through the IRA. That wasn't part of the plan at all. The plan was to launch a, a diplomatic offensive. And they put great store by President Wilson's 14-point plan. Everybody was talking about this when French Prime Minister Clemenceau said, 14 points, 10 was enough for Moses. <laughs> so they all think, right, we're into a new age of democracy. There are going to be all these big concessions to Labour, and, and surely we've got a strong case for self-determination. So Kelly turns up and says, you know, please let us in. So did Ho Chi Ho Chi Minh, but the delegate, the Paris, uh, the, the sort of people running the Paris Peace Talks say, no, I'm sorry, self-determination is not for you. So um, it's clear by 1920 that uh, Labour is kind of retreating from, uh, from Moscow, as, as it were. Uh, I think there are a number of reasons for this. I mean, first of all, you have the emergence of the Soviets as, as direct action. Here's one of the more famous ones here, a brewery, famous for the slogan, we, they took over a bakery and, and put, ran up the slogan, we make bread, not profits. But any kind of workers control, anything under workers control, and there were about 100 Soviets declared in Ireland at this time, where instead of just going out on strike, workers took over uh, a bakery, a factory, a creamery, timber, uh, timber yard, gas works, whatever, ran up a red flag, appointed a committee of management to run the, 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 the concern. That would have been called a Soviet. But um, these emerged from late 1918. I think one of the first was the Taylor Soviet in York Street um, in Dublin. But uh, probably the f one of the best known would have been the Limerick Soviet in, in was it April 1919. So these are seen to be expressions of um, you know, rank and file um, action and the unions are not entirely happy with them um, and they, they start to see them as, as, as a threat. For the moment they're not a big problem because the economy is booming, employers are able to make to meet uh, wage demand so by and large everybody's happy but when the boom turns to bust in 1920-21 um, things start to change. Then you have the emergence of communist factions in May of 1919 you have this sort of ultra-left group breaking away, calling us the revolutionary SPI, they're very critical of the SPI, they're saying, what are you doing? You've all these great organisers, you've all these top people, you're very well connected, you know, but you're doing nothing, which is really true, they were doing nothing, except passing resolutions and, uh, and so on. So uh, they, they break away to form the, the revolutionary SPI. And you've got Roddy Connolly as well, Sean McLaughlin, the boy commandant from Easter Week, they're kind of trying to reform the Communist Party, or form a communist party, and um, they're very critical of the labor leadership. So communism seems to be, become a bit of a problem. Then in March 1919, 
the third international, as it's called actually, in 1920 changed the name to the Communist International, a common turn is formed. And Lenin is completely against the, the formation of, of the second international. So he, he rushes quickly to form a Communist in International. And this is a different kind of international. It's not just an annual talking shop. It's, it's Lenin's idea is that it'll be a world party. And the, the ECI, the Executive Committee of the Communist International, will be the general staff of the World Revolution. So if you want to be in the common turn, you have to meet certain, you have to meet 21 criteria, and you can't have anything to do with the Social Democrats. Then I think the, the National Revolution turning violent starts to put Labour on the back foot, they're getting a bit uneasy. Um, increasingly, uh, the British military starts to direct itself against the Labour movement, particularly the ITGW. Uh, Labour is worried about funds being sequestered, unions being declared illegal. They see what happened to the to the transport union after Easter week. You know they're getting a bit. They're not. They're not going to back off the basic support for for self determination, but they are trying to distance themselves legally from from the illegal activities. So in 1920, the Congress of 1920, the executive says, look. The international labour movement is divided between the second international and the third international. We really want to come down on, on you know, taking sides, so we won't affiliate to either international. There's one group that says, no, that's specious neutrality. We demand you affiliate to the, to the Communist International. So they take a vote on it, and that motion is rejected by two to one. So uh, to sum up then, why, why did Labour support the Bolsheviks? Then you, you have to see it in the context of the time, you know, remarkable period, 1917, 1921, uh, rapid growth and politicisation of, of trade unions, particularly the ITGWU. This belief that the war is going to be, will be followed by a new age of democracy. Democracy becomes a universal value for the first time. Uh, immediately after the war, you've got President Wilson's 14-point plan. You've got Soviets, not just in Russia, but uh, in, in Germany, and Hungary, and uh, northern Italy. And then the, the, the Bolsheviks program, you know, chimes with the Sinn Féin program on, on these two uh, crucial issues, opposition to the war and support for national self-determination. Then it's easier for Labour to be political on foreign policy than on domestic policy. That very much suits somebody like Tom Johnson, who doesn't really want conflict, he doesn't be confronting or choosing between the parliamentary party and Sinn Féin. Um, so, but on, on, on foreign policy, he feels, you know, we, we can assert ourselves there, and in the process, we're helping to, to assert Ireland's um, independence on the international stage and make a unique Labour contribution to, to the national struggle. And uh, I think, you know, Johnson deserves a lot of credit for that. It's, um, it's unfortunate that he, he, was, he was a bad leader, although he was, uh, he was a good secretary. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I want to thank the, the committee for inviting me to make this presentation. And I may, I'd also like to acknowledge my um, uh, Emmett O'Connor. He was, was a source for me when I was doing my work in, 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 in my paper and my book. And particularly his book, The Reds and the Green, which I think is is a required reading for people involved or interested in this period. And here's a short outline of what I intend to uh, speak about over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, first of all, uh, it, you know, the paper is about the the, the state to state uh, relations that uh, started between Ireland and what was then the Soviet. Uh, uh, Soviet Russia, just this, this sort of these embryonic state-to-state um, -state relationships, uh, uh, which um, took place in uh, first of all in uh, in North America, um, chiefly in Washington and in New York, where um, the, the Soviet delegation um, was present, where the Irish delegation were there as well. Um, I'm going to say a word about Tsarist Jewels, which you may have heard about this thing, which it was really a saga rather than just a story. Um, and I'm only going to give a word about that tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about this treaty which Mick mentioned, this, this proposed treaty between Ireland and, and uh, Soviet Russia. Um, then I'm going to talk about McCartan, Dr. McCartan's visit 
to uh, the Soviet capital to ratify the draft program, a uh, draft treaty. Um, then I'm going to say a few words about the fates of the pr main protagonists involved in these connections. And then a few conclusions. Just uh, my sources, um, primary ones are the records of the Department of Foreign Affairs, which are in the National Archives, and the secondary ones, uh, appropriately, uh, Desmond Greaves' uh, biography on, on uh, Lee Mellows, Emmett's book I've mentioned already, uh, Derma Ferreter's Judging Dev, and of course, uh, the great Soviet encyclopedia. All 32 volumes, everyone should have one. <laughs> And um, these are the two Soviet delegates, um, Santeri Norteva and Ludwig Martens. And this photograph was taken in America uh, about eight, 1919. Um, so the Soviets were in America seeking uh, recognition from the US government and trade connections. Uh, an informal embassy was established in New York in, in early 1919, led by Martens, this is the gentleman on the right. Martens was born into a German family who owned uh, steel mills in Kursk, Russia. In 1893, he entered St. Petersburg State Institute of Technology, where he became uh, acquainted with Lenin. He joined the uh, Russian uh, Social Democratic and Labour Party, uh, uh, but was, uh, was uh, sent into exile by the Tsarist um, police uh, and he ended up in America in 1916 where he worked as a vice president for an engineering film called Weiner and Poser in New York City. After the, ninth, after the February uh, 1917 revolution, Martins together with Leon Trotsky and 270 other Russian Social Democrats re returned from the States to Russia on a steamship. He was then redeployed back to, Amer back to New York in 1919 to head up the Bureau, which had a staff of about 35 people. Uh, he established commercial contacts with about a thousand American firms, despite the fact that already uh, uh, trade with but with Soviet Russia had become illegal. Uh, and the purpose of these trade contacts, of course, was to uh, get rolling st railway stock and other essential uh, materials for a modern uh, economy. Now, uh, Santeri uh, Noroteva um, was the son of a Finnish Swedish telegraph officer and Russian Jewish mother. He had been a, a school teacher and a member of the Finnish diet. Under threat of prison for criticizing the government, he was forced to leave for the United States with his family in 1911. He became out of in Finnish, Russian, and left-wing politics, and then uh, joined Martins at, in the bureau. And now, the Irish delegation. This photograph, uh, taken in New York in 1919, um, shows the Irish delegation, plus two other people. Uh, I'll start with them first. This, this guy here on your right, um, Dermot Lynch, and, and this is John Devoy, Caesars, before, uh, before uh, De Valera. And I'll start with the Longfellow, De Valera. Um, one of Dev's earliest statements on the revolutionary situation in Russia was delivered at a huge anti-conscription meeting in Cork City on the 4th of December 1917, just on the, the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution. He applauded the mass gathering and declared, the militant stance of the people was an effective guarantee that the young men of Ireland would not be asked to take Russia's place on the front. <clears throat> now, his mission to the United States was also twofold, to seek recognition from the US government, and secondly, of course, to, wear, to, to uh, collect a war chest for, uh, for the struggle for independence. 
and through 1919 and 1920, his entourage moved, uh, pr promoted the Republic among Irish Americans right across America. Now on the extreme left here we have Harry Boland from Marino, an IRB man, a veteran of the, a veteran of the Rising, uh, he was uh, an elected member of the Dáil following the Asian election, the first Dáil. Uh, and uh, to, to use uh, Fer Dermot Ferriser's description, he described um, uh, Boland as Dev's valet, shepherd and manager. He and Dev were the ideal team as Boland got to people's hearts and Dev to their heads. John Devoy, the leader of Clan gave another insight. Boland often differed with Dev privately and sometimes bullied him and in such cases always won. Now the next man I want to introduce you to is Dr. Patrick McCartan from uh, standing on Dev's left. Uh, he was from Carrickmore County, Tyrone. He had experience of America as a young man whether he was in the Clan Gale. And, re and returned to Ireland, qualified as a doctor, medical doctor, and joined the, the Dungannon clubs and the IRB. He didn't participate in the Rising, but he was imprisoned in England. He was um, appointed as, uh, he was also a member, he was elected member of the, of the first doll and appointed as the doll's official representative of the United States. But he had another role. He had also been appointed by the IRB as his delegate to Russia. And then making up the quartet of uh, Dev's delegation was Lee Mellows to the left of Harry Boland. Mellows um, was elected for the Galway constituency where he had given leadership to about a thousand people, he rallied a thousand people during the Rising, the biggest group outside of Dublin. And his value had been recognised by no less than James Connolly. And he included the following words, uh, Connolly did, the following words in the last edition of the Workers' Republic. And he wrote this. We are at liberty to announce that Lee Mellows, the energetic organiser of the Irish Volunteers, who was recently deported to England, has been rescued and is now safe back in Ireland. Mellows described himself in America as Dev's John the, ba the Baptist for his role in scouting ahead of the, sh of the chief's cavalade to innumerable destinations. He was the youngest, only five foot three in height, uh, and considered uh, jaunty, but not by the conservative Irish American leaders. And this then brings me to the other two uh, guys. First of all, um, uh, John Devoy and Dermot Lynch. They both were then associate, chiefly associated in America with the Friend of Irish Freedom Movement. De Devoy, of course, was an old Fenian, and Lynch had actually been uh, in the GPO during the Rising and is said to have been the last man out of the GPO. And we'll come back to them now in a little while. But meanwhile, Dev's mission in America soon took on an added dimension when it became clear that the cause of Soviet Russia commanded considerable support among political activists, and close relationship developed between the Irish and the Soviet envoys. And I think the following illustrates that perhaps best. And these, these are short extracts from Harry Boland's diary for 1920. 9th of January. Had lunch in Capital Restaurant, Washington. Dine with Nuroteva, Martins, and ladies, in brackets, suffragettes. Fine Soviet. 27th of January, Washington. Meet Martins, Nuroteva, and Miss Paul, a New Jersey suffragette leader. And Senator Hardwick from Georgia. And the 3rd of March, Washington, same. Very pleasant evening, Bolshevists in great form. So I think these short extracts indicate lobbying that was going on, joint lobbying with the, with the two, delegates, two delegations, 
and particularly with uh, involving suffragettes, which kind of draws parallels between uh, American and Irish situation, where in Ireland, suffragettes such as Helena Maloney, Charlotte Despard, and the Sheehan Skeffentings were later members of the Irish Friends of Soviet Russia, formed in 1928. Back to America. As the cause for recognition of the Irish Republic and support for, United, for Soviet Russia became intertwined in Irish-American circles, it also became a, a source for division. At a women, an, an Irish Women's Council meeting held in New York, Lee Mello has publicly expressed his view on Irish-Soviet cooperation. Russia has given more encouragement to the Irish Republic than America. But other Irish Americans expressed concern, especially report appearing in, in American newspapers from Friends of Irish Freedom Movement, <coughs> Devoy and Lynch, claiming that there is, quote, there is nothing in common between the political system of Bolshevism and the Sinn Féin Republican system, which has fused all classes in an amity that is not known in America or Russia. Further, linkage with the Balfics meant that the opponents of the Irish Republic were emboldened with a propaganda opportunity. Sensational allegations <laughs> emanated from England that the Bolsheviks had sent millions of dollars to Sinn Féin and that de Valera was in cooperation with them. Fake news? Mm -hmm. But the Irish Americans had access to the New York Times and carried the following and carried under the follow under the headline of De Valera makes denial the following statement. The idea is to try to injure the Irish cause by playing on prejudice. The purpose is that the old cry of German gold or Bolshevik gold. I have specifically denied time and again that our, our organization uh, never takes a mark or a ruble. Now, these sentiments were being expressed in, uh, in the, against the background of a growing red scare in America. And Alexander Palmer, President Woodrow Wilson's Attorney General, claimed that communist agents were attempting to overthrow the American government. Palmer recruited John Edgar Hoover, who I'm sure you will have heard of in, perhaps in a later context as a long-serving FBI director, as his special assistant. An espionage, attack, uh, an espionage act was employed to arrest 10,000 suspects in swoops over the United States. And caught up in that swoop, of course, was Big Jim Larkin. Now, I, um, I mentioned, and uh, I have a word or two, about um, the Tsarist jewels for an Irish Republican loan. And this indicates the closeness that had developed between the Irish and the Soviets. Uh, the Soviets were feeling the pinch from the Palmer Act, and uh, were short of cash to run their bureau. And um, Martins uh, met with, with, uh, met with uh, McCartan, and produced uh, some czarist, what was said to be czarist jewels, and in exchange for these jewels, the Irish gave a, a loan of $20,000. Uh, there was security offered, but I'm not going uh, in, into that tonight because the whole story in itself. Um, I will be giving, if you're interested, I will be giving a presentation on this in Dublin City Hall lecture series on the 24th, Tuesday, 24th of October. 1 o'clock to 2, if you're interested in that. But apart from the money uh, and this gesture of solidarity between the two, uh, there was the draft treaty of recognition, which had 15 clauses, recognition, but also uh, clauses about mutual privileges for Irish Soviet trade. Well, here's probably the two most uh, interesting uh, uh, clauses. Taking uh, cl article number 12 on the left, um, the, um, the 
the avowed purpose of the contracting parties being to end imperialist exploitation, to bring about disarmament, um, arbit international arbitration, uh, secure peace for peoples of the world. Perhaps uh, the, one, the most interesting one here is to enter into a league with similarly minded nations, each nation, nation to be represented by delegates freely elected. So what they're getting at here is sort of an alternative to the League of Nations, which was then being put together by the, by, in, in Switzerland by the, by the major bourgeois powers. And on the right then, perhaps most remarkably of all, is this clause that the government of Soviet Russia entrusts to the accredited representative of the Republic of Ireland <coughs> in Russia the interests of the Roman Catholic Church within the territory of the Russian of Soviet Russia. So I think you can see this is designed to allay religious and other fears which perhaps were foremost in the Irish minds. Uh, now, I should say that uh, before I press on, that um, De Valera finally um, makes up his mind that, that the possibility of getting recognition from Woodrow Wilson is not going to happen. So when he get, reaches that position, having managed the relationship with, with the Soviets and with Irish America, up to that point, he decides it's a, it's a waste of time now waiting for Wilson. So he decides to dispatch McCartan to Moscow to have the treaty signed. But before he did that, he was careful to make sure that he, the treaty was sent to Dublin. Uh, and he suggested the following. Uh, Dr. My, Dr. McCartan might be considered by you as a delegate from our government to Russia to ask for official recognition. I think he should be accompanied by at least two others. One representative of organized labor, for example, Cahal O'Shannon, Tom Johnson, or William O'Brien, three of whom, of course, Emmett has signaled already, and one representative of industry and trade. So with these rec recommendations, you, I think we can see that De Valera was thinking ahead for Irish-Soviet Irish trade, but also that he recognized that the additional leaders with left-wing convic convictions would strengthen McCartan's revolutionary credentials in the Soviet capital. And that resolution was adopted by, by the first law on the recommendation of Arthur Griffith. Nineteen nineteen was it? Twenty. Mm. Uh, nineteen twenty. Nineteen twenty. So here are the two um, got main people that uh, McCartan met in America. On the left here is Maxim Litvinov. He came from a wealthy Lithuanian Jewish back banking family. <coughs> he joined the or, uh, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party quite early and he was in at the very start with the Bolsheviks. He had been sent into exile for about 10 years, uh, said to have spent two years in Belfast, or some time in Belfast. Um, he, um, he married an English woman, Ivy, uh, Ivy Way, um, Ivy Lowe, and um, when McCartan are, uh, is heading for Moscow, uh, Letvinov uh, um, is now in charge of uh, contacts with Western uh, countries and Western business. And this, uh, and this on the right is Georgi Chichirin. He was from a wealthy um, family of Russian nobility, His, whose father had actually been a, uh, had been a diplomat himself, but he had. Um, he had been opposed to the war and also joined the Bolsheviks. Now, following the defeat of the interventionist forces on the side of the White Russians in the, in the Civil War, official government attitudes towards Britain changed pragmatically. Anxious to normalize relations with industrial powers, again to access industrial goods for their war-torn economy, they were in the process of negotiating 
an Anglo-Soviet trade agreement when McCartan arrived. According to McCartan's own memorandum on his visit to Russia, he first met Levinov in Raval, the capital of, of Estonia, now renamed uh, Tallinn. And he wrote, and this is a quote, I found that Litvinov was not enthusiastic about my visit, studied me with a sort of curiosity, and asked me if I had any program or plan to submit beyond the draft treaty. Strangely, McCartan did not. And even without an articulate socialist colleague, he could have at least articulated the, doll, the first doll's democratic program that Emmett was talking about. Litvinov went as far as intimating to McCartan that it was folly to proceed to, Mo to Moscow. But McCartan pressed on to the Soviet capital, where he was received by Noroteva. This is the man who he had negotiated a draft treaty with in America, less than a year previous. Noroteva was now a senior official with the Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, and he facilitated a meeting with Chicharin. Chicharin now is the Chief Commissar of Foreign Affairs. Chicharin received McCartan more politely than Litvinov had, but he, he too quizzed him on the possibility that de Valera would accept home rule status for Ireland, on the Ulster question, and on reports that Irish Republicans were hostile to communism. Chicharin also inquired after the current status of the Irish Citizen Army. Chicharin even invited but Chicharin also in the cases that uh, the Soviet state was now considering this treaty. But he did invite McCartan to remain in Moscow pending the outcome of the discussions with the British. But it came as no great surprise when on the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day, the British Ang or the Anglo-Soviet trade agreement was signed. <coughs> McCartan <coughs> discharged one of his final duties as the Irish representative to Russia uh, with, a member, member, with a further memorandum on his impressions of the nascent Soviet Union to the first door, displaying a strong sense of political skepticism and ideological opposition. The following extracts sum up his attitude to the new order. Though it is claimed that the present government is dictatorship of the proletariat, it is nothing of the kind. It is a dictatorship of the Communist Party, which represents less than 1% of the population of Russia. And the dictatorship of the Communist Party means, in reality, dictatorship uh, of about half a dozen leaders of the party. And on, his, and on his impressions of early Soviet attitudes towards Ireland, he wrote, There are some interest in Ireland on part of those one meets. But the revolution in Ireland is seen as a national one, and hence it was concluded that little or nothing was in common with communism or the world revolution. There was some admiration for the fighting qualities of Irishmen, but there were not, as there were not communists, and Irishmen everywhere are reactionaries, that is, they are not usually socialists, and so on. So, with those words from a disappointed emissary, the first period of Irish-Soviet diplomatics, di diplomatic contacts are brought to an end. Now, uh, a few words on the fates of Neuroteva and Martins. And this is another photograph of America, 19, in 1919, I would think. I don't know if you can read, uh, there's a kind of a label on the side of the, of the camera. Fox News. Fox. Anybody make it out? Mm. Fox News. Fox News. <laughs> so, now that is the same, uh, it may not be the same Fox News, but it reads that. I'm sure um, Rupert, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, it was hardly involved. He's not that old, Mick. <laughs> uh, anyway, before McCartan had set sail for his uh, mission to Moscow, it was becoming clear that the presence of his two Bolshevik, con his two Bolshevik contacts in America 
was no longer acceptable to the Soviet, but to the US authorities. The Parma raids increasingly took their toll on left-wing America and pro-Soviet circles, and foreigners were, were targeted for arrest and deportation. By late 20, the Soviet Bureau was closed, and Noroteva got out just in time to avoid, to avoid Palmer's men. He went through Canada to England, where he was jailed for a time, and eventually deported to Soviet Russia. As I mentioned, he was, a high, uh, he, he was in a high administrative position in the foreign ministry before McCartan's arrival. However, sus suspicions arose about his bona fides, and as recorded by Mark McCartan in his memorandum, Nuritaeva was thrown into prison on suspicion of being a British agent. Whatever the accuracy of this suggestion, Nuritaeva seems to have overcome the setback and having been released, he again gained an important position, this time in the government of the Soviet Karelian Republic. His life ended in a Leningrad hospital in 1929, in unexplained circumstances. As for Martins, according to the New York Times, he was deported from the US in January 21, accompanied by his wife and two children, and 46 men and women from the, from the Bureau. Having returned to Russia, he became a senior figure and a central planner in the industrialization of the Soviet Union, and a specialist on the theory and production of diesel engines, which uh, a diesel engines were actually called the Martins engines. He died in 1948, and in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the development of the Soviet state, he was buried in Novodvichy Cemetery in Moscow, a burial ground then reserved for outstanding figures in Soviet society. And the fates of the, um, of the Irishmen. Um, I think you probably know this already, but I'll just go over very quickly. Harry Boland, of course, was, uh, during the Civil War, shot in a hotel in Scarries, uh, and died after three days in St. Vincent's Hospital, which was then located on the corner of Leeson Street and Stevens Green. Um, Lee Mellows was <coughs> um, executed during the Civil War, one of, an, uh, one of four, one from each prov province as, um, by the Free State authorities, uh, but not before he had written his prison notes in Mount Joy, which uh, were drawn uh, from a program of the First Communist Party and attempted to um, offer to the Republican movement um, a program, a social program, to be, to be part and parcel of the demands of the anti-treaty forces. Um, Dr. McCartan, when he returned from Russia, just in time for the treaty, end of the treaty debates, he voted for the treaty, the only one of the four uh, with Dev, and Dev, who voted for the treaty. Um, he actually, uh, but he never took up a position in the Free State. <coughs> and, uh, but he re-emerged in, in a political life in the 40s when he joined Clan the Pobolukta. And he stood uh, in the presidential election in 1945, the one that was won by Sean T. O'Kelly, and did very well, got about 20% first preferences in that election. Dermot Lynch, uh, of the Friends for <coughs> Irish Freedom um, also sided with the treaty um, and continued to be an opponent of de Valera's for the rest of his life um, and returned to Ireland in, in the thirties and died in his native county Cork. Devoy, John Devoy, also sided with the pro-treaty forces and visited Ireland in 1924 to show his support for W.T. Cosgrave's government. And just to conclude, a couple of concluding points then. <coughs> Relations began very warmly in America on an anti-imperialist basis. Uh, the 
but it's important to recognize the Irish delegation um, represents a democratic national movement and state rather than a radical socialist, uh, with the exception perhaps of uh, Lee Mellos. Uh, and when the national interest of the Soviet Union um, became more important in, uh, than uh, ratifying a treaty on a polit for political considerations, the, um, the interest of the Soviet state trumped uh, the second possibility. Um, and then finally, Dev recognized the potential of the Russian Revolution's <coughs> promise for small countries and the prospects of the future. And he went on um, in, as the leader, uh, um, after Fianna Fáil came to power, Dev went, uh, went to uh, the League of Nations and spoke for and voted for the inclusion of the Soviet Union in the League of Nations. He also dispatched his, uh, one of his uh, most uh, trusted lieutenants to become the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Frank Aiken, who led uh, what is regarded by international relations uh, theorists as Ireland's golden period at the United Nations in the late 50s and early 60s. Notably, the, uh, new, um, the treaty on restricting new, the spread of nuclear weapons. And Aiken promoted that. When it was brought to fruition, he went to Moscow and signed Ireland's Ireland, um, accession to that treaty under de Valera's uh, Taoiseach ship. Um, and finally, to say about Dev, his fine, one of his final acts uh, in his, la his second last year uh, in the Auras was to receive the great Soviet composer, Dmitry Shostakovich, as a signal that he too agreed that in 1973, it was time to establish former relations between the two states. Thank you.